Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our first Irish Studies guest lecture in this term. Um, I'm very pleased to introduce our today's guest, Dr. Neve Nigaun, to you. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Um, Neve Nigaun is a senior lecturer in the Department of History at the University of Limerick. And uh, her research focuses on Irish art and architecture, and particularly on religious architectural heritage and material culture. Her book, Medieval Ecclesiastical Architecture in Ireland, 1789 to 1915, Building in the Past, was published by Four Courts Press in 2015, and Ambition and Magnificence, Roman Catholic Architecture in Ireland, 1828 to 1936, is forthcoming with Liverpool University Press as part of the, their reappraisals in Irish history series. Now, before we start, um, just a note, this lecture will be recorded. So if you do not want to be seen, just switch off your camera. Um, we also take some pictures, some screenshots of you now. So again, if you do not want to be seen, just switch off your camera. Neve, we are more than happy to have you here as our guest speaker today, and we are now all looking forward to your lecture. So the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much, and thank you very much to colleagues at Würzburg. It's a, a real privilege and an honor to, to speak with you today. Um, if you can just give me a few moments, I will share my slides and then we can begin. So can people just let me know that they can see the slides? Yes, yeah. I can see everything. Okay. Perfect. Great. And if, if at any point you can't hear me, or if I am speaking too quickly, which happens sometimes, um, please just let me know and I'll do my best to slow down. So first of all, I would just like to say thank you again for the opportunity to present my research at the Irish Studies Würzburg Lecture Series. I'm absolutely delighted to be able to do so, and I hope to be able to make the journey there to meet colleagues in person before too long again, and also just to extend a very warm welcome to you all to the University of Limerick. Um, if, you ever, if any of the attendees at the session today are in Ireland or in Limerick, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, if there's anything that we can do to help, you know, put you in touch with people or, or make your, your scholarly visit or indeed your, your, your social visit uh, more enjoyable. So the topic of my paper today is on the changing uses and possible futures for religious architectural heritage in Ireland. And in particular, I will focus on the built heritage of the Roman Catholic Church that was produced throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. And to begin with, I'll just give a brief contextual overview um, and, and argue really that it's, that it's possible to see Catholic built heritage as an example of an interrupted or ruptured architectural legacy that then uh, essentially has to reform itself um, by the early 19th century. So following the Reformation, I'm just going to move on, uh, the medieval parish churches had for the most part uh, become used by the established Church of Ireland. Um, and in many cases, these were then replaced or turned to ruin throughout the following centuries. So the, the medieval built heritage essentially had been transferred uh, in the parochial structures of the parish churches in particular had been transferred to the established Church of Ireland. Through the 17th and the 18th centuries in particular, you can see quite a lot of um, uh, demolition, destruction um, of that medieval built heritage simply because the parish churches were either too small, in many cases they were too cold, this comes up quite a lot, and they were being replaced by um, more commodious and, and, and um, uh, more appropriate uh, buildings. So we have a, a kind of a layer of destruction of the medieval built heritage during this period. And the images that I have on the screen here, you can just see, um, this is the um, Cata Hibernia uh, image from the early 17th century. And you can just see in the kind of top center of the screen, um, the little uh, parish church just kind of um, uh, beside the words the castle of Askeaton which refers um, 
So you can just see um, the, the little uh, tower building and then an aisle uh, and a nave. Uh, so that's the medieval parish church that would have been used by the uh, established Church of Ireland following the Reformation. And you can just see in the image beside it, which is a photograph, um, the, 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 the extent to which that then gets destroyed um, into the 19th century and just that little turret uh, remains. So this is, I suppose, just to give one example of that um, kind of layer of, of demolition that happens throughout the early modern period. Um, there are some exceptions in terms of that medieval architectural heritage uh, that remains in use uh, throughout and that still remains in use, so continuous use. Um, and two examples here of Church of Ireland parish churches and the Church of St Maltos in Kinsale in County Cork and St Mary's Collegiate Church in, in Yall, um, also in Cork. So these are kind of rare examples of churches that continue in use um, from the uh, Middle Ages to the present day. Similarly, the medieval cathedrals um, had uh, also been transferred to the property of the established church. And for the most part, these actually have fared uh, better than the parish churches. And they were more significant in terms of their architectural um, symbolism, in terms of, of the quality of, of building. And so, so we have more examples of continuous use, including St. Mary's Cathedral in Limerick. And you can just see an interior and an exterior shot of this um, 12th century cathedral, which remains in use by the Church of Ireland community today. The vast majority of the friary and monastery buildings that had been such a central part of medieval religious life really fell into ruin for the most part, um, uh, with some being put to alternate uses such as law courts, um, universities or even as private homes. And I suppose the, the best example of that would be Trinity College Dublin, which had been um, a monastic foundation before it was um, uh, changed in use uh, to the, the college. Um, and I've just given two examples here, uh, one of Jerkpoint Abbey, um, which uh, fell into ruin and then remained in ruin um, and is now a heritage site. So that's kind of one kind of way in which uh, these ruins come down to us today. There's many um, friary and monastery rooms that are just really on private land. They're not part of the uh, kind of heritage uh, experience that people can have. And um, because they're on private land, there's plenty of people, myself included, who will jump over the electric fence and, and roll under the, the hedge and kind of get in and look around. And typically people are OK with that. But, you know, you're, you're kind of technically not supposed to do that. So we have a handful, really, that are uh, kind of heritage sites that are, you know, um, people are insured to go and visit them, etc. And they're, they, they're provided with interpretive materials. And um, but but for the most part, the, the medieval monastic and friary heritage is is largely in ruins. I've just given um, one of a, a very few examples uh, where it's not in ruins and that that's Holy Cross Abbey in County Tipperary, which was restored from a ruined state in the early 1970s um, uh, by, uh, by the, the parish there. And, and that's a wonderful example of um, a really interesting restoration project that took place. And I can speak a bit more about that if anyone is interested. So, um, so I think what I'm trying to kind of give a sense of is that medieval layer of built heritage that really becomes um, interrupted in terms of, of certainly Roman Catholic engagement with it. Um, and, and while, of course, there are exceptions and complexities across this general narrative, this, I think, gives us a sense of how Catholics were effectively separated from a sense of architectural legacy or heritage following the Reformation. The penal restrictions on building further established that rupture. So, so Catholics were not allowed to build and they were not uh, allowed to build certainly magnificent buildings or buildings that had a kind of uh, significant presence in the urban landscape throughout the penal uh, restrictions. And I think it's also worth bearing in mind that uh, during the, this period of restriction on building, Irish Catholics relied heavily on centres like the Irish colleges across Europe and places like Leuven, Rome, Salamanca, Paris and Prague. And these were extremely architecturally rich environments that formed part of what we might think of as the Irish Catholic architectural imagination during a, during a period of restriction at home. 
So following the achievement then in, in 1829 of Catholic emancipation and reflecting the changed socioeconomic political conditions experienced by Catholics in Ireland throughout the 19th century, we can see a huge expansion then in architectural activity. So following rupture um, and following this period of restriction, you have a huge efflorescence of building. And this can be first observed, and um, this can be observed in a first phase of building prior to the mid-century famine, um, largely in the construction of church buildings. So providing the necessary infrastructure for worship that hadn't existed before. And from the 1850s onwards, we then see a second phase, which is characterized by a much broader range of architectural types. So including convents, schools, monasteries, as well as cathedrals and churches, together with the expansion or redevelopment of existing buildings to make them even more magnificent and more visible in the landscape. And it's this second phase of building during the second half of the 19th century that gives us the grand architectural monuments of St. McCartan's Cathedral in Monaghan and St. Coleman's Cathedral in Cove, to, to give two of many possible examples. And this was also a period of intense transnational expansion and the construction of cathedrals and church buildings associated with Irish Catholics across the world. And I suppose um, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York would probably be the most well known um, of those. So the architectural activities of the Catholic Church in Ireland continued apace throughout the 20th century. Demographic changes, and um, so people moving largely from urban, uh, sorry, from rural to urban um, environments, um, and population growth led to the construction of churches, schools, and buildings for healthcare. Churches were built in modernist and historicizing styles throughout this period. And in a period of economic hardship, the church was the major patron of the arts and of architecture, often commissioning important new works with some innovative and beautiful results. Um, and some of you, um, you know, this is an extraordinarily early church really for, for Irish modernism and um, built between 1927 and 31 by the American uh, architect Barry Byrne um, in Cork and um, known, I think, locally as Jesus of the Sweaty Armpits, which I think is an interesting <laughs> uh, local term um, for such, such a building. But you can see a real um, commitment to exciting architectural modernism here. I think um, Ellen Rose has noted that when this building was first opened people thought it was a cinema rather than a church because of that real kind of art deco style that you can see but it's, it's an absolutely magnificent building um, and and you know you can see some of the probably some of the most interesting architectural experimentation that was allowed for in that 20th century period of economic hardship was the church they had the money to build um, and and were were the major patrons so you have people like Liam McCormack um, the Donegal based architect really um, kind of bringing uh, a particularly Irish kind of uh, modernist flavour uh, to his church building and this is the beautiful St. Michael um, in Creese Lock in Donegal and you can see the way his church echoes the curve of the mountain and kind of sits very beautifully into its architect into its environmental landscape. So uh, in the second half of the century we also see in, of the 20th century just to keep us in the right century and um, we also see the innovations then of Vatican II reflected in architecture and a new period of church building reflecting the dialogue mass and the greater sense of connectivity between priest and congregation. And this, this sustained church building throughout the 20th century reflected high levels of attendance at mass um, into the final decades of the 20th century. And it's really not an exaggeration to say that church building was a major part of Catholic community life throughout the 20th century through fundraising initiatives, through donations. It also kind of created a whole social context um, as well as the architectural context. As the, the Visible Divinity Project led by Sarah Roddy has shown, church building projects also offered individuals the opportunity to memorialize themselves and their families and to express their own agency and identity in relation to the space of the church. And therefore, these buildings can be seen as important spaces for family and individual identity and expression, as much as reflecting the broader identity of the parish or the diocese. 
However, the exposure of persistent abuse of children within industrial schools and reformatories run by religious orders by Mary Raftery's States of Fear documentary broadcast by RTE in 1999 reflected the beginning of a deep change between the broad public position and perception of the church in Ireland. By the beginning of the 21st century, attendance at mass and services like confession um, was in decline, reflecting, among other things, the impact of the abuse scandals. These changes are reflected in the condition of Catholic architecture. In several cases, churches have closed down due, due to shrinking congregations and the sharp decline in vocations. Sorry, I've got the wrong slide there. Yeah. Um, just a few weeks ago, the demolition process started at the Church of the Annunciation in Finglas in Dublin um, because it was simply too large uh, for the congregation that was there. Um, uh, and you, that, that's just a screenshot um, from, from um, a, a Dublin news site. And it's really quite striking, I think, to see these buildings um, being, um, being demolished at this time. Uh, this building was simply too large for the, for the parish to, to heat, um, you know, the, the maintenance costs were simply too too great um, and it was very interesting to see even some of the oral histories that were being captured by people who remember the church being built um, and would have recalled it you know it being built for a much longer period uh, it was intended to be built for a much longer period than, than it in, in fact survived for so it's it's the history of Catholic architecture throughout the 20th century in Ireland therefore is marked by expansion stylistic diversity change and then contraction within a relatively short time frame. And it's interesting to consider the presence of building activity across literature and the arts more broadly. Um, and I think, and, and I know some people here might be have an interest in, in Irish literature rather than architecture, but some of you might know, for instance, the opening scenes of Eugene McCabe's 1992 Death and Nightingales, which actually focuses on the um, construction of uh, of McCartan's Cathedral in Monaghan, which I showed earlier, um, or for example, M Emma Donoghue's more recent novel, The Wonder, um, which also explores the 19th century uh, church building context. So these are these activities had a, had a very um, significant cultural footprint um, in, in many ways, and that's reflected across literature. So having provided this very quick whistle stop tour through Irish Catholic architectural activity in the 19th and 20th centuries. Therefore, I'll turn now to, to the more focused topic of my paper today, which is the contemporary engagement with this vast and complicated architectural legacy. And my paper is informed by my project, Religious Spaces in Transition, which was um, funded by the Irish Research Council and which allowed me to bring together uh, different scholars from across a range of perspectives. So this project included a symposium in January 2020 in Limerick, and there we are all gathered together looking at buildings, which is what we like to do best. Um, and it allowed uh, me to bring together many of the researchers and stakeholders involved in the management and conservation and reuse of Catholic architecture in Ireland, um, as well as then a, an online seminar, which was hosted by the Michal O'Clary Institute at UCD in May 2021. And this topic is, is in its very nature vast and multifaceted, and therefore any attempt to consider the subject in a holistic way requires a collaborative approach. My talk today reflects the importance of this network of researchers and scholars in building new approaches to thinking about Catholic architecture in an Irish context. And um, as uh, Maria mentioned, uh, my talk today um, also or, uh, reflects, I suppose, the groundwork for my current book project, which is under contract with Liverpool University Press and, and is, is forthcoming, as you mentioned, just <laughs> as soon as I can get the time to sit down and, and focus on it. So how do we need to think about the extensive and complex built legacy and with the architectural footprint of the Catholic Church in Ireland, as in some cases it disappears before our very eyes? So in September 2020, news reports circulated of the destruction by fire of the former Sisters of Mercy convent and chapel in Skibbereen, County Cork in late, in, in late September of last year. The chapel, which was built in 1867, 
was listed in the National Inventory of Architectural Heritage as being of regional significance and is described as a highly accomplished French Gothic church, sorry, French Gothic style church built to the designs of the renowned architects Ashland and Pugin. Locating this um, on a map of the town, you can see uh, that it was part of a Catholic ecclesiastical complex to the northeast of the town of Skibbereen, which included St. Patrick's Cathedral, a Catholic school and a parochial house. And this image of, from Google Maps Street View provides an insight into the condition of the buildings before the fire, so you can see quite overgrown and abandoned. So the reporting of the fire in the media clearly shows the mixed and often precarious status of such buildings. It was noted that the buildings had been unused, empty and used by rough sleepers for shelter while being owned by property developer Bernard Hennessy. A plan had been in place to sell the site to Remcall Capital, who had planning permission for a 10 million development of the site. The former chapel was to be developed as a commercial hub, including hot desks for use by the community and the convent to be, re to be converted into apartments. According to the Irish Times report on the 2nd of October, Remcall planned to go ahead with the development, notwithstanding the damage to the site. And it was quite heartening to see that media responses also included contributions by Jesse Castle, an important architectural historian, highlighting the social, historical and architectural significance of the buildings. And indeed, a report on Hennessy's acquisition of the site in 2015 noted that it was the beauty of the three buildings, the chapel, convent and the school that motivated his investment, as well as the fact that it is a prime location. It is my intention, he said, to have them restored to their former splendour. In April 2021, it was reported that this development, including the commercial office spaces, as well as the four storey apartment block and housing development on the site, would proceed with onboard Planola, that's the Irish uh, planning uh, agency, noting that the restoration of significant architectural heritage in Skibbereen could not be understated. The extent to which this can be considered a restoration, however, um, is debatable, and I think it's more appropriate to describe it as transforming the site and some of the remaining built elements to a completely new use. So many of these same factors appear and reappear when considering the architectural legacies of the Roman Catholic Church in Ireland today. So very often we see the clustering of key buildings within environments as a kind of devotional landscape or an ecclesiastical complex. So we see that at Skibbereen. And um, we see that it's they often occupy valuable prime locations in terms of the actual property value um, uh, of the buildings. Um, and, and we also see um, uh, discourse around their architectural value and their significance, as well as the questions of dereliction and those associated risks, their historical and social significance, and then the types of plans proposed for their reuse and development. As Jesse Castle and Gillian O'Brien noted in their contribution to the Religious Spaces in Transition Symposium, uh, these buildings are highly significant and highly precarious, both in terms of the speed of redevelopment of the sites and issues such as vacancy and dereliction. And I think the convent in Skibbereen really gives us a perfect example of, of the kind of precarity of these, these buildings. Now, of course, this risk varies across what we might consider Catholic buildings in the Irish landscape. An active parish church or a cathedral building, for instance, will be at significantly lower risk than a convent building like Skibbereen that's not occupied. And Gillian and Jesse have examined the current status and use of a number of presentation convents in Ireland, um, and their research demonstrates the particular risks of dereliction and vacancy in terms of irreparable damage to interiors and the structural fabric of buildings. Um, to a certain extent, uh, vacancy and dereliction uh, makes a, a building much easier to, to, to ultimately demolish because there's um, what, be, what is valuable within it essentially becomes degraded to the extent that it can't be maintained any longer. However, my central contention in this paper is to foreground a further form of precarity around the way we treat and engage with Catholic architecture in the contemporary world, a precarity which is grounded in an insufficiently nuanced critical framework for managing these buildings. This critical or theoretical insufficiency, coupled with the speed of redevelopment and decay, leads to a situation of some urgency. As I'll hopefully make clear throughout this paper, 
The identification of this critical gap grows from the emerging body of rich scholarship on the topic, and the identification of the gap also hopefully opens pathways for it to be addressed in future. So to begin with, I would like to unpack this idea of an insufficient or incomplete theoretical framework for understanding Catholic architecture in Ireland, starting off with a few definitions around temporal frames and building types. So firstly, it's important to note that I'm specifically focusing here on Catholic buildings in Ireland that were constructed from the late 1820s to the late 1930s. So the buildings that were constructed after the period of rupture that I described in my opening overview. And this is the framework that I'm also using in my current book project, using the Cathedral of the Assumption in Carlow, built in 1828, and the Church of Saints Peter and Paul in Athlone um, in 1936, as temporal bookends. My contention is that this period should be treated as a defined period of, archi of, a defined period of architectural development with its own logics, goals and ambitions. A parallel temporal frame has been established for the consideration of modernist church buildings in Ireland in the 20th century, and this has enabled a rich critical and comparative discussion reflected in the work of Lisa Godson, Kathleen James Chakraborty, Ellen Rowley and others. Of course, when you try to establish a defined temporal framework associated with a particular period of development, examples immediately come to mind that complicate and challenge your tidy narrative. There are lots of examples into the middle decades of the 20th century of Catholic buildings that deploy historicizing rather than modernist architectural language. Um, and one might think, for example, of the Byzantine inspired red brick church um, of the Franciscan um, uh, building on Cork's Liberty Street, just to give one example, which opened as late as 1953. And Richard Butler's recent article on the construction of the Church of St. Mary um, Immaculate at Dromore County Cork, also in the early 1950s, provides another example of the continued use of historicizing styles in a smaller scale rural context. However, notwithstanding these examples of late historicism, I believe that it's possible and helpful to define this period between the 1820s and the 1930s as one concerned with at least three central elements. So these three elements that I would see as kind of uh, defining this period of architectural development are as follows. So the first element is a concern with the development of a particular kind of architectural and spatial magnificence that resulted in the production of deeply symbolic and highly participative and highly stratified spaces. And if you think back to Cove Cathedral or St. McCartan's Cathedral, they are extraordinary buildings in their landscape. They are, they are spatially and architecturally magnificent. So the second concern that I see as defining this period of, of development is the use of historicizing styles such as classical, Italian Romanesque and Gothic modes of building. And the third is the conscious creation of a recognizable architectural identity for the Catholic Church in Ireland following that period of suppressed architectural activity. So in terms of the religious history and politics of this period, the concept of the mid 19th century de devotional revolution will be familiar to scholars of this period. And of course, the architectural development of the Catholic Church is closely aligned to this with all of its well charted contradictions and nuances. The devotional revolution broadly refers to the post famine shift towards engaging with, um, sorry, a post famine shift towards a kind of Catholic devotional culture that was centered on the church and on the building of the church. And it included new modes of engaging with the church and of bringing people into the church, such as novenas, um, things that were highly participative, like charity sermons and um, processions, involvements in confraternities, for example, so drawing people towards the church as the centre of worship. And just to complete this explanation of my temporal frame, um, in my book project at present, I've split this period up into three key sections. So I look at 1828 to 1849, really as post-emancipation up to the mid-century, and then 1849 to 1922, so that uh, encompasses the devotional revolution up to the establishment of the free state, 
And then 1922 to 1936 and the early years of the free state, really up to a point at which modernist building styles become more significant across the landscape. And I also look at the years 1849 and 1850 in some detail and at the actions and activities of the Irish Ecclesiological Society. And while this society wasn't hugely influential, it does provide a valuable insight into the discussion around the role of Catholic aesthetics, art and architecture, as well as an insight into key contemporary networks and nodes of influence. So the establishment and recognition of this time period and um, from the uh, 1820s up to the 1930s um, as a significant period of architectural activity enables it to be visible and considered as such within processes of conservation, reuse and development. At the moment, it's not considered within that period, which leaves, which leaves it vulnerable to um, not essentially knowing what we should be preserving or how we should be engaging with it, because we don't have that conceptual frame around what, what is it that we value about this. So the term Catholic buildings in my title is also deliberate and broad. I have mentioned convents, chapels, schools, cathedrals and churches so far in my paper, but could also include many more building types, including mother and baby homes, Magdalene laundries, reading rooms, hospitals, nursing homes, seminaries and further buildings that were essentially collaborations between church and state in the provision of social services. Indeed, it's also very possible to broaden this and to consider Catholic environments, which might include the domestic and public spheres. It's certainly possible to see this kind of identification being clearly signalled when walking through different urban and rural spaces. One thinks, for example, of the Stella Maris sculpture at Dollymount, just a stone's throw from where I am today, and um, this uh, sculpture of the Virgin Mary, which was um, actually commissioned by the dock workers um, of Dublin. Um, uh, unveiled in 1972, um, or this Sacred Heart statue um, in the Liberties in Dublin city centre. Um, so these are just two examples of, of the kind of Catholic uh, public sphere that one encounters frequently, or even for instance, um, the site of the Healy Pass um, in um, the Cork and Kerry border, um, which could be considered a Catholic space. So the sheer scale and number of Catholic buildings in Ireland proves a challenge. Almost every town and village has its Catholic devotional infrastructure. And this infrastructure informed so many aspects of life from the public to the domestic sphere. I find the word infrastructure a helpful one when thinking about the ways in which these buildings structured experience and created an architectural, spatial and effective environment in which people lived their lives. In their exhibition for the 2014 Venice Biennale, architects and commissioners Gary Boyd and John McLaughlin focused on this idea of infrastructure, which they described as simultaneously a technological and a cultural construct. They were thinking about the relationships between infrastructure and modernity in 20th and 21st century Ireland, but this framing can also be applied usefully to Irish Catholic life. Infrastructure, according to Boyd and McLaughlin, consists of both visible and invisible networks. They cite Paul N. Edwards' observation that infrastructures shape um, and are shaped, in other words, co-construct the conditions of modernity. Infrastructure for Edwards is simultaneously omnipresent and invisible, tending, only, tending to only become conspicuous when it is either new or broken. And I think this idea of Catholic devotional infrastructure only becoming visible when it's new or broken is really an interesting one in terms of informing my thinking about how, how we see um, and what we see when we understand these Catholic devotional infrastructures and how they informed Irish life throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. So thinking about devotional infrastructure gets us away from thinking only about monuments, by which I mean individual high status buildings. Um, when we think about what is socially and historically important. So if we focus only on the monument, we risk losing a huge amount of social and spatial information about sites of engagement and resistance with and through this infrastructure. 
It's important to note also that preservation is not always the goal here. That would be, I think, an impossible task and probably undesirable in terms of creating meaningfully, meaningful, continually transforming environments for living. However, these environments are being changed extremely quickly at present, as we saw at Skibbereen, uh, without any regard really for their embedded networks, histories and infrastructures, leading to a loss of this effective and spatial aspect of our history and heritage. The maintenance of churches or cathedrals by themselves essentially divorces one monument from its broader context and maintains just one element of that spatial and social experience of Catholicism. This was usually the most ceremonial, public and celebratory aspect of Catholic practice and community, but this historical experience was deeply interwoven with the lives lived across other aspects of that Catholic infrastructure. And the different facets of the 19th and 20th century Catholic landscape, considered more broadly, reflects a complex social and spatial fabric that included experiences of deep faith, joy and communal worship, as well as neglect, stigma and abuse. A lack of attention to the spatial frameworks of Irish Catholicism during the 19th and 20th centuries risks losing an awareness of how this infrastructure operated across different registers, including the ephemeral and the embodied. So the physical experience, for example, of walking from a terraced cottage to the cathedral steps, for instance, to the viewpoint of a bishop delivering a consecration sermon framed by carved marble and mosaics glittering in the newly installed electric lights. In their work on the financial relationships between clergy and congregation, Patrick Doyle and Sarah Raddy have outlined the need to think beyond the traditional conceptualization of the extractive priesthood and the subject laity. They argue that a shift of historical analysis from an institutional level to one focused at the micro level of individuals has presented a more nuanced understanding of the lives of those who worshiped within the Catholic faith in Ireland. And this shift in perspective can be extended to thinking spatially, a shift from the monument to viewing the spaces and sites of Catholicism as a complex network encompassing multiple sites from the domestic home to the laundry refectory to the cathedral sanctuary and convent parlor. At our May 2021 Religious Spaces in Transition Project Seminar, we were delighted to have Chris Hamill and Dr. Catherine O'Donnell present on their Open Heart City project, as well as the Atlas of Lost Rooms. And these projects explore ways in which innovative and attentive scholarship can re-engage with and recover some of the spatial experiences and perspectives of those who actually lived and worked in the Magdalene laundries, even as aspects of those buildings are being demolished. And I really think that the Open Heart City project is a gold standard in terms of how to meaningfully engage with stakeholder communities in rethinking the historical relevance of these sites and their potential future uses. Sarah Roddy's keynote at the Religious Spaces Conference in 2020 also illustrated these complex relationships brilliantly. Her exploration of the ways in which money, giving and donation uh, are deeply embedded within the fabric of the church itself opens up the extent to which the churches are actually social and personal sites as much as um, as much as uh, parochial and diocesan sites and both Joseph McMahon and John McCafferty also emphasize these points in their closing address. The intimate interweaving of these buildings and Catholic life, the buildings as funded by monthly donations by those who could little afford it, but who gave anyway, and the idea of the buildings as the patrimony of the poor, as well as sites for the performance of wealth and success. It was also really important for us to have members of the presentation sisters present, who spoke of their own experience um, of interactions with these types of plaques and memorials within ecclesiastical buildings and um, that they're also markers of faith and remembrance as well as sites of social signification and sometimes it is helpful that an elaborate stained glass window that asks us to pray for the donor should sometimes just be taken at its word as well as a jumping off point for historical sociology. 
So while scholars like Doyle and Roddy have emphasized the importance of this kind of changed perspective, an overview of the current treatment of Catholic building reflects um, significant gaps between this complex theory. So we have this wonderful body of theory that allows us to see these buildings as these complex sites of social signification. We can think about them as evidence of networks. We can think about them as important um, ways of understanding uh, the social and lived and personal and interpersonal uh, experience of Catholicism that was so central to 20th and 19th and 20th century Irish Catholic life. So we have this kind of scholarly richness that is emerging, but none of that is really making its way across into how those buildings are being preserved and treated, I would say with the exception of the Open Heart City project um, at the Magdalen Laundry at Sean McDermott Street in Dublin. Um, I'm just conscious of time. Um, Maria, can you let me know if I'm going a little over or am I okay for another 10 minutes or so? Yeah, that's fine. Of course. Okay. Yeah. Great. Thanks. So I'm going to now, having kind of, as I hope, established a sense of this critical richness that is emerging around how we can understand these buildings as important evidence of the lived experience of Catholicism throughout the 19th and 20th centuries. I'm going to now uh, just give an overview of how they are treated um, by heritage and planning legislation and, and hopefully giving a sense of the gap then um, between those two systems. So the principal legislation directing the protection and management of Irish architectural heritage is the Planning and Development Act 2000. And this act requires all local authorities in the country to maintain a record of protected structures, which must be of special architectural, historical, archeological, artistic, cultural, scientific, social or technical interest. And this act also provides for the designation of architectural conservation areas. So if there's a particular landscape or assemblage of buildings that's particularly important. And other relevant pieces of legislation would include the Architectural Heritage and Historic Monuments Act of 1999, the Heritage Act of 1995, and the National Monuments Act of 1930. So buildings of architectural and heritage significance constructed after 1700 oh, sorry, um, are uh, listed in the National Inventory of Architectural Heritage. So that would be the majority of the buildings that I'm talking about today. And these surveys provide the basis of recommendations to the relevant minister for the inclusion of structures or areas for protection. So the architectural and built heritage policies development developed by the relevant department also guide the management of religious heritage. So the Heritage Council, for example, provides valuable guidance and resources for the management of religious built heritage and has carried out a survey of churches and places of worship in Ireland. So the 19th and 20th century built heritage of the Roman Catholic Church in Ireland is listed in this national inventory um, and then is characterised as to whether it is um, of international, regional or national significance. So St. McCartan's Cathedral in Monaghan that I showed you earlier, um, towering above the town by leading architect J.J. McCarthy and finished by William Hague, um, is listed as being of national architectural and artistic and social significance. Um, Cove Cathedral, which was the other building I showed you, is listed as being of international significance, just to, to give you a sense of that. Um, you can see um, that the Convent of Mercy in Skibreen, which I focused on earlier here, is listed as being of regional significance. So they're kind of uh, categorised in terms of their importance. Um, and this listing and categorization is actually quite important because it informs what can be done to them essentially uh, within the legal framework. So the treatment of um, uh, Banada Abbey Church and Convent in County Sligo provides one example of this in action essentially. So this building, which was a convent, um, was listed as being of regional significance. The buildings were constructed in the 1860s. They're now redundant, so they're derelict um, and uh, they're vacant and they're listed in the inventory as being a vital part of the small and somewhat scattered community and as a result of being as as being of considerable social significance. However, in 2004, members of Sligo County Council agreed that only the facade of the Abbey Church and Convent were to be included in the record of protected structures. So only one small element was to be protected and the rest could be swept away. With the argument that the, the council didn't want to stand in the way of development, but wanted some small part of the building to be retained. 
So in the context of the opinion given by a senior planner that the building would be demolished entirely without some element of listing, the motion was passed for just the facades to be retained. And I think that this example gives a good um, insight into the competing pressures of preservation and development and the resulting pragmatism that informs the treatment of many of these large buildings, um, particularly those that have fallen out of use like this convent. So in making the case for the treatment of this period between 1828 and 1936 as a defined period of architectural development, I'm drawing on the work of many scholars and researchers on this subject who are contributing to our growing understanding of their significance and function. And the, perspective list, the perspectives listed below, I believe, should be integrated into future practices of reuse, conservation and development. So first of all, I'm inspired by the broader turn towards considering religion and religious architecture in spatial terms. So many of the surveys of the Catholic buildings that predate this expanded critical framework have tended to focus on issues of architectural style in formal terms. So for example, how a building reflected a particular stage of an architect's career or the extent to which it reflects kind of formal innovation. All of this is, of course, very valuable, but it's just one part of the picture and one part of how we consider these, bu these buildings to be valuable, particularly when it comes to making decisions about their reuse or management as they transition from one use to another. William White makes this point very clearly in his wonderful book, Unlocking the Church, when he points out a disciplinary focus on architects rather than architecture, on style instead of experience. And he calls for a renewed focus on the experience of architecture, on what he describes as the interplay of sight and sound, emotion and reason, considered thought and sudden impulse when we think about these buildings. And I would argue that this experiential dimension also needs to be considered when thinking about processes of transition. So the kind of facadism that we see in Banada Abbey, just kind of keeping one little slice of the building really um, doesn't uh, engage with, with, the, with the kind of critical function and experience of those buildings and, and what is actually valuable about what they can tell us as heritage. The broader theoretical turn then towards material religion and vibrant matter by scholars like David Morgan and Jane Bennett recalls attention to the effective realities of these church environments. Um, a consideration of the multidimensional environment of the church buildings in particular, including sculpture, stained glass, flowers, paintings, music and architectural forms, reflects the importance of paying scholarly attention to this embodiment paradigm and the mediation of religious experience through physical bodies and sensual perception. These physical environments, considered in the context of the framework of material religion, can be viewed as valuable spaces to understand the, the historical experience of individual and communal faith and spirituality, as well as the development of power structures informing decision making by individuals and groups. So I think to understand how Catholicism became so important as an effective um, social spatial experience, we have to understand what it felt like to be in these environments. That's really important historical information. I would also argue that there has been an emphasis on the individual monument or the individual case study. Um, and I think that uh, this means that we don't think about that network of buildings, we don't think about those interactions and that broad kind of social um, uh, crossing and interweaving that happens between them. So Ruth Slatter, the architectural historian, has advocated for what she describes as a more than architectural approach in relation to such buildings. Such an approach, Slatter argues, should consider the character of faith spaces to be the result of their physical design, their perpetually developing physical materiality, their uses and users. She also notes the importance of the materials that make them, how these materials change, the things that circulate through these spaces, the people who use them, the spiritual beliefs that they encapsulate, their religious practices conducted within them and their alternative uses. In Slatter's framework, faith spaces are in a constant state of becoming. So I've, I've also mentioned the work of Sarah Roddy and Patrick Doyle in relation to the very important Visible Divinity Project, as well as Gillian O'Brien and Jesse Castle. But I also want to mention the contribution 
contributions of Caroline Wiki, Lisa Godson, and Wilson, um, who have focused um, critical attention on the materiality of the buildings themselves, and then also the, the business and craft networks that they engaged and their roles as sites of consumption and creativity. And Owen O'Mahony, Sheila DeClaire, and, and Lisa Godson have, among other things, focused attention on the importance of ritual, procession and material culture. And Deirdre uh, Raftery, uh, Cara DeLay, Richard Butler and Victoria Pearson have examined issues of agency and the relationships between networks and individuals. Sophie Cooper and others, including Sarah Roddy, have examined the importance of international and diasporic networks in relation to church architecture. And Helen Phelan, and others have examined the role of sonic and effective environments of song and music within these spaces. And this isn't an exhaustive list, but it gives some sense of the contemporary themes and issues in this field as it continues to grow. So this more than architectural approach is entirely evident in the work of these scholars and others. And this isn't just a, a listing of friends and colleagues, but rather an important reckoning of a significant shift in the way that these buildings are considered and framed. Buildings that we encounter, I think, with a certain blend of intimacy and criticality. We visit graves and we write about these churches. We look at theories of material heritage in the knowledge that the last Magdalen laundry closed well within our lifetimes. I was nine when the last Magdalen laundry closed in Ireland. So I hope it's clear, therefore, that it is the very richness of the scholarship that is emerging around this topic from a number of disciplinary perspectives that allows me to identify the current critical or theoretical insufficiency. And this riches, richness needs to be knitted together in a way that informs practice and decision making around what is valued and why certain decisions are taken around use, reuse, conservation and demolition. I think that this more than architectural approach allows us to consider the social, spatial, effective and formal qualities of buildings and devotional landscapes when thinking about their current treatment and future uses. And the current practice of retaining certain structural elements as part of a complete repurposing of buildings, a, a real example of facadism, does not re reflect the resonance of resonances of these buildings. The prioritization of beautiful buildings such as churches and cathedrals and the downgrading of buildings of what is seen as lower architectural value risks obscuring the, the spatial and social heritages that are essential to understanding contemporary Irish society and also the role of religion in shaping Irish society and life in the past. And this is just an image from the uh, homepage of the Atlas of Lost Rooms, which I really can't recommend highly enough. It's a wonderful project if people want to, to have a look at it later on. So to conclude, where would the establishment of a richly informed, critical and theoretical framework for the reuse, management and conservation of Catholic buildings leave us? It still leaves us with the problem of rapid development, starry-eyed developers and vacant buildings often at risk. One approach that I've been taking in my work is to gather an example and examine examples of past and current practice and to consider what can be learned and fruitfully applied to future practices. So just, um, you know, some different examples that, that I can point to in the discussion perhaps, perhaps would include Kevin Clancy's restoration of St. Mel's Cathedral in Longford following significant damage by fire, but also Laura McAtachney's um, really important engagement with the material heritage of the former Magdalen Laundry at Donnybrook in Dublin. Um, and as, as I've mentioned, the Open Heart City project um, and the Atlas of Lost Rooms project as really interesting examples of how uh, digital uh, um, and interdisciplinary environments can come together to really also bring stakeholders, um, former family members, for example, of people maybe who are within the Vital Laundries and Mother and Baby Homes, and to have them as part of, of the, the conversation and really lead the conversation. And I think that's really, really significant as part of our ideas of transitional justice. Just click through here. Um, the transformation of the presentation convent um, at Nanonagel Place in Cork provides another example of the potential of these sites to be transformed into valuable community spaces that are deeply meaningful and historically resonant. And it was wonderful to have Danielle O'Donovan at the symposium in January and to hear from the presentation sisters themselves in terms of their experience of transferring their most important convent, their founding convent of the presentation sisters to hand 
hand that over and to, to, to kind of relinquish control of that. Um, it was very moving to hear them talk about that experience and um, because part of that was about uh, having to declare it derelict um, and what that meant emotionally for that community. So these are, are different models and practices I think that can be learned from. And I think that an integration of the rich, critical and historical exploration of these sites with these careful, current careful and deeply thoughtful practices of engagement can help us to establish shared modes of practice that move us beyond just the maintenance of a facade um, or the, the wholesale destruction of aspects of our material heritage without any time for consideration and engagement. So I think it's, it is certainly a challenging task, the establishment of a framework that allows us to talk and think about all of these interwoven aspects together, um, rather than consider them in isolation. And I think that there are some helpful discourses around the material heritages of religion internationally, which need to be nuanced in the Irish context to take, to take account in particular of the very close relationships between church and state. Um, but I think that we can really learn from those. So I hope um, throughout this talk I've outlined um, some of my work in progress on this topic and in particular why the establishment of a sufficiently nuanced theoretical and critical framework around these buildings is necessary for a more informed approach to their management, conservation and reuse. So the job at hand, in a way, is twofold. The development of that appropriately nuanced approach to the buildings as we find them now requires us to rethink how and why we value them and what kinds of values and stories we are willing to preserve. I think that thinking about networks and about infrastructure rather than monuments helps us recast and rethink our approaches. And I believe that taking the effective and experiential histories of Catholicism seriously as part of our approach will also enable us to expand our understanding of fundamental aspects of Irish historical experiences, the experience of the body within that infrastructure. So thank you so much for your time and, and attention. And I'm very happy to take any questions at this point. Neve, thank you very much for this intriguing and most interesting talk. Um, and uh, yeah, I would say that we can open the discussion. So now it's time for questions, maybe also comments or anything you would like to add to the talk. Uh, I think it's um, better if you use your artificial hand, the virtual hand, because it's better to see then. I think in, in future, when we get back to normal, we will all have little yellow hands in our pockets that we will raise <laughs> when, when we want to speak. <laughs> okay, as I cannot see any hands uh, at the moment, uh, I have a general question. Um, you, you know about the secularization process in Ireland that has been called uh, the quiet revolution. And uh, within your talk, I got the impression that you see it as kind of a chance just to combine, you know, historical heritage, as you called it, and um, uh, religion and um, um, the Catholic religion in particular, of course. Um, so where do you see chances? Can, can you uh, maybe um, come back to what you said and maybe also um, expand a bit on that? Sure. Um, I think to a certain extent, and I, I think I, I mentioned the word a kind of critical intimacy in relation to how we engage with these. And um, it, it's quite extraordinary how close people live in relation to, to these structures and infrastructures. Um, the, you know, we're still only engaging now with the, you know, commissions of inquiry, which are very fraught still in terms of actually establishing things like you know legal um uh redress um for abuse um people are you know we still live with people who lived in the Magdalen laundries this is this is very close to us all you know um mm -hmm. these are our friends our neighbors our mothers our sisters our aunts and I think it, it's very um it's, I, I, my, my perspective is that it's really important that we actually understand the effective experiences of Catholicism in order to understand why and how that happened. How was that enabled? How do we understand the enabling of that system, um, you know, which, which allowed for that? But it's so incredibly close, I think, that it's very hard to find those chances because 
there's many, many competing um, discourses that are happening. And that's very, very understandable. And I think, you know, the the the, the um, rights uh, of survivors come first, you know, and I say that as an architectural historian, they come first, you know, uh, and as, as an Irish citizen um, and as a scholar of this material, but they will always come first. And I think that we have to think about engaging those, you know, th those people. Um, and it's very interesting to, to, to look at the Open Heart City project and to see the great generation generosity of spirit that um, uh, survivors of the Magdalene Laundry system bring to that in terms of rethinking and kind of opening out discussions of how they feel that site should be used, for instance. So the chances that we have, I think, have to be embedded within that context. It's very hard to get, I suppose, critical distance um, when you're living in through that process. Um, and I think, you know, but, but I think, you know, you work with the conditions that you have. And I think this type of um, you know, it, it's that's why I think it's so important to find spaces where we can all talk about this together. So I meant to mention at the end, um, we've established a new uh, research network, which is called the Material and Cultural Heritages of Religion in Ireland Research Network, which is not the snappiest title, but um, it, it in in the acronym sounds actually like McCree, um, which means my heart, <laughs> which we, mm -hmm. we were saying at the, in Irish, uh, it sounds uh, a little corny, but actually in many ways, I'm kind of happy to have that uh, emotional kind of uh, flag at the outset because that's the context that we're working in. And I think, you know, where I see the chances, I think it's about creating discursive forums mm -hmm. instead of dealing with things in isolation. You know, I see you know, even online people are saying, well, oh, I went back to see the mother and baby home where I was born and oh, it was suddenly demolished and I didn't know and I had no say in that. And that that's a real, you know, that's where the chance should have been. And it's, you know, it's not necessarily that that person is going to say, well, I want it preserved as a museum. That's not necessarily what people want, but I think they want an opportunity to have a voice in the transitioning of that kind of spatial environment that was so significant. That's a long answer to your question, um, but I think. Um, yeah, but I can see it's a lively and a very complex and ongoing process. Yeah, yeah. but thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, Marianne. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for this presentation that I found just really fascinating. Um, um, and also really um, theoretically invigorating. And I say that because my area of specialization and knowledge is not Irish studies. I'm an Americanist, um, come from American studies, and that's maybe a bit of the background for what I'd like to offer maybe as a just sort of a comment, um, something that really resonated with me, and then maybe more of a case study question that I'm curious about. I mean, the comment, I think what you mentioned about this fixation on monuments this, of course, in the US American context just really resonates because this is this fixation is part of um, the attempt to come to terms with the monument landscape, but it's also a focus of activism. At some level, there's a sense if we can just get rid of this damn monument, it will correct things. Um, so I think it is really important to, to, to think that more complexly, more thoroughly. So that's my comment. And here I have a case study and I'm wondering, Again, um, because I don't know um, the context well enough, I'm wondering if there's anything comparable to this case study going on in New York currently in the Irish context. So I'll sketch out the case study um, or the, um, the example of one of these negotiations about what the mission is, what the function is of church spaces, of religious spaces. And here the particular example is in Harlem. It's the Harlem Grace a congregational, congregationalist church, which is a historic black church in Harlem, um, very prominent in the Harlem Renaissance beginning of the 20th century. And again, with this um, development of a dwindling congregation, the church building um, you know, has suffered um, deterioration, although it's been in continual use because of natural disasters, et cetera. Um, and here maybe also important is the, you know, the US American Protestant structure of the congregation as the organizing unit. There's no overarching institutional church, it's the congregation. And the congregation has been very keen and pushed forward for essentially, essentially a tear down and rebuilding of the building for smaller church space, but integration of affordable housing. 
And their conflict is with the um, historical um, society in Harlem that is very keen on preserving um, yet the very minute, not just the facade, but the entire complex um, as, um, as an effort to push back gentrification, to preserve this, this landscape, um, also push back against um, a court, gentrification as a whiteification um, of this area. And so you have two, I mean, I think two good causes here, and that's what makes it so fraught, trying to decide what to do with these spaces. And I wondered a little bit in listening if there are any comparable examples in which you have the congregations wanting to do things with these buildings um, and other institutional forces pushing in another direction. If anything at that level, not just you know the, the capitalist developers um, that you expect, but maybe some other examples like that. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's such an interesting um, case study, and it's it's so interesting to think about. Um, I would just say about the kind of monument issue. First of all, I think it is, I think it's it's, it's such it's actually such an interesting comparison that I hadn't thought of previously, um, because um, of course the monuments are embedded within infrastructures, but they're just they're node points, you know, within infrastructures, and I think it's really important to think about that as to think about infrastructure. Um, with and, and about that kind of social network and what they mean and, and how really to a certain extent they need to their their historical significance as kind of agents within their environment depends on how they're encountered in that kind of embodied network context. So I think you know there's I can understand why people focus on on the monument and I think that's really important and maybe it's a next step to think to think about well how do we move the conversation on to think about infrastructure um which I think is is important I think you know the the case study that you outline in terms of um Harlem is is, is so interesting um and it is it reminds me actually quite a lot of um there was there was a quite a period of kind of controversy throughout the 1980s and early 1990s in Ireland because of the changes brought about by Vatican II. Um, so uh, Vatican II essentially meant that quite a lot of reordering of church space had to take place. Um, they wanted to kind of take away barriers between priest and congregation. They wanted to uh, create a much more dynamic space of engagement. And then, of course, they were working with buildings that were, you know, over 100 years old and that were seen as having deep heritage value. And actually, in that case, in, similarly to Harlem, I think it was the, the religious communities that were saying, you know, it's more important that these are spaces of living faith. Um, and what a space of living faith for us means that we change them and, you know, they're always evolving. Um, whereas there was the actual local communities who really valued them more um, for their heritage uh, context and said, you know, you, you know it, it's an absolute destruction of important heritage in order to, um, to change those. So there was, there was a really interesting, it, it kind of came down to idea of ownership to a certain extent. Um, and as you said, a kind of sense of mission. Um, and I think these cases actually have to be worked out on a case by case basis and um, in some in some respects I think that actually I do think and, and it's not just that I think it's the nicest place in the world Nano Nagel Place in Cork is such a good example of continued um, kind of engagement conversation kind of continually working with that community to find ways of um and, and actually the nuns are the most kind of burn it down and build social housing like to a certain extent sometimes the nuns will be the most radical ones of all you know and, and will shock the heritage professionals by by kind of saying well it's much more important for us to kind of live out a sense of mission than it is for us to kind of preserve something in aspect kind of as a memorial but um but I think Nano Nagel Place is a wonderful example of how it's, it's about process it's about continuous dialogue um, and it's about actually not moving too quickly I think one of the things that we're seeing in Ireland at the moment something goes on fire a developer comes in and buys something something can be knocked down literally overnight um, and it's just that's where you have a huge sense of loss and I think you know thinking about processes of transition has to be open-hearted I think to all perspectives and I really think it's it's about kind of creating that kind of space for dialogue and multi-stakeholder engagement because there's always a way of thinking through a way in which all of those values can continue to be held, I think. Um, and I think getting away from a sense of just, you know, 
pre, you know heritage preservation as the preservation of, at all costs of the monument I think we, we do need to move away from that to a certain extent otherwise we will just end up with a landscape of museums and nowhere for people to go so I hope <laughs> thank you um yeah Ina Yes, um, Neve, thank you, thank you very much for that um, interesting um, uh, talk. I, I, I think that's a, such a such a pertinent and and, and topical um, issue. Um, I was um, so 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 my question um, has to do with uh, a coincidence. Um, a couple of days ago, I, I read uh, some chapters of Derek Scally's The Best Catholics in the World, uh, because we are discussing ex excerpts from that text um, in about uh, two weeks time with our students and students from University College Cork. We do have a study day and um, the, the focus is a bit different. It's about discovering Irish uh, identity and hybrid identities and so on. And um, in Scally's text, um, I was reminded um, uh, to a certain extent of your project because at one point he says, um, um, it, he talks about the, the, for everyone who hasn't read it, he talks about the, the, the um, Irish Catholic past and the legacy um, of the Catholic Church in Ireland, um, good and bad, <laughs> we might say in a nutshell. Um, and at one point he says, um, you know, and you were also saying some of these, um, um, uh, architectural spaces um, uh, are, are built on, on prime spots where prominent spots within the cities. And um, he says, um, why not transform them into museums, but not, you know, architectural museums or just sites, um, architectural historical sites, but uh, museums that uh, make use them as museums for um, the, the uh, past or by, uh, in a way uh, bringing closer to people uh, the, the past of the Catholic Church in Ireland. So um, using them um, in a way as a museum, as a site of memory at the same time. And um, I think he makes a point about I'm not sure, again, um, about a, a Macklin laundry or a mother and baby home, which could be turned into something and where people could access um, the, the um, rich heritage of the Catholic Church in Ireland, but also, you know, these, these um, uh, traumatizing um, aspects of it. And by that, engage with it actively. And I thought this would be um, kind of a good way of, we could also say community use of some of these buildings. And then um, it, it could serve both um, ends, uh, you know, it, growing awareness of, um, you know, that the, the history of the Catholic church in, in Ireland, and then also of the more specific architectural, preserve the, the buildings as, um, you know, architectural um, historical monuments. Um, do, do you know of any um, projects uh, that are that have followed um, Scully's, um, uh, um, uh, you know, idea, or is is there something that's similar to that, or or also, what do you think about um, this idea? Thanks, Ina. I think um, first of all, I think Derek Scully's book is great. I would highly recommend it. It's a wonderful text. Um, so there's a couple of things there. My very practical brain, um, when someone says, let's open new museums everywhere, thinks, oh my goodness, we don't have enough national funding for the museums that exist at the moment. And they are, you know, I, I always just kind of tend to, to get a fright when someone says, let's open new museums. And, and I say, let's, let's fund the museums we have appropriately first. Um, but I think that the Open Heart City project, um, you know, it's really interesting to hear what the survivors want um, from that. And they want it to be a site of conscience. And it was really interesting because the, this kind of group kind of came together in response to the fact that a planning permission had been given to transform it into a budget hotel um, and just erase that whole site, which was the last remaining um, open laundry site um, in the city. Um, and, and they really said, no, you know, we're, we're 
you know, it really galvanized people in terms of standing up against that. But they said they didn't, you know, it was about the appropriateness of the use. They don't necessarily want it to become a museum. And I think there's been some really interesting uh, engagements through uh, different art forms. So some of you might know Anu Theatre Productions. They did a really significant theatre, site-specific theatre piece um, in that site where people could actually engage. And it also looked at um, ideas of, of contemporary um kind of human trafficking as well. Um, uh, so that was really important, I think, as an intervention. But what the survivors say is they really wanted to be used as a site for the provision of services, uh, which would mean that people wouldn't go through the same thing again, which I thought was really significant, you know. Uh, and, and actually, you see quite a lot of that. So quietly, uh, let's say, presentation content building was being transformed into social housing units or kind of housing for, sheltered housing for elderly, for example, or different types of community use. So there is certainly a space, I think, for certain, I think, and we do need to have more of a space for remembrance and recovery. I think that's really important. We don't really have that at all, which is really extraordinary kind of given the importance of the cultural footprint but I think that comes a little bit to that issue of that kind of critical intimacy that we experience with this at the moment so I would say that that you know there's multiple potentials because I mean you literally can't walk down a street in any urban environment without meeting one of these buildings so the scale of it you know it, they can't all be turned into sites of remembrance but there's certainly opportunities for them to be changed I think that it's really important as well um to think about this question of the, the prime value of the sites and one of the big discussions at the moment is about uh, the new national maternity hospital um, and some of you might be familiar with this that it's been moved from the very kind of old and not fit for purpose site in Hollis Street in Dublin city centre to a new site which is co-located with St Vincent's Hospital um, but it is in fact still owned by an order of nuns who want to retain ownership and here it comes to really the sticking point which is about um, ethos, it is about governance, it is about control and it is about this complex interweaving between state and um, and religious services um, throughout the 20th century. Um, so there is you know a movement uh, towards uh, separating church and state particularly in the context of healthcare and I suppose that has a um, you know th that would have particular resonance for people and again critical intimacy um, in the wake of the repeal movement, in, re in, the, in the wake of the symphysiotomy scandals, for instance. Um, so, you know, that just gives another layer in terms of that kind of inter interweaving. So um, that would be my, my answer, Ina, for the moment, I think. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Neve. Um, Antonius. Yes, I also wanted to thank you very much for the talk because I really didn't have too much information about the topic before. So, of course, as an Irish study student, I have a bit of an idea, but not really uh, in particular how those religious structures uh, keep evolving practically through time. So my question is a bit of just out of curiosity. You mentioned that many medieval structures are left vacant and some also are standing at inside private property where you would have to hop over an electric fence. And, and I was just curious, those spaces, do you know of cases where they are transformed and maybe kind of repurposed then again for the public so with an intermediary time where they were in those um yeah where they were practically private um where you weren't allowed to enter them and then i don't know maybe the owner kind of thought of a way to really give them a new purpose to kind of reopen them maybe as a public space just curious whether we know of such cases yeah, that's that's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, so I suppose there's so many different uses and, and reuses um, from the, the dissolution of the monasteries, for instance, um, where, you know, all of those buildings, they were really quite good quality buildings in many cases. Um, so the stone gets used in different ways. Sometimes they get transformed. Sometimes they get kind of, you know, in, in one case, it gets kind of turned into a kind of pleasure room in a, in a landowner's uh, domain, for instance. Um, they get used as law courts. They get used, you know, for all kinds of different reasons. Um, by the late 19th century, um, you have a certain rhetoric um, in the Roman Catholic Church to retake the, the ruins. And there's this rhetoric around, you know, um, uh, 
kind of moral ownership of the buildings and and even um some of the really high status buildings so some of you might know the rock of cashel saint patrick's cathedral and the rock of cashel just an incredible building um medieval ruined medieval cathedral um to retake that and to kind of reoccupy it and because um you know there was the critical mass kind of of people and there no pun intended sorry <laughs> when one says critical mass um but the um uh, what you have then is really a resistance from the uh, National Monuments Service, from heritage legislators who essentially put in place the Ancient Monuments Act, which means that a building which is in ruins cannot be repurposed for religious worship, which is quite an extraordinary kind of act to put in place. So unless a building is in continuous worship by that time, so like St. Mary's in Yall or St. Multos or St. Mary's Cathedral, you can't at that point legally turn a building back from being a ruin into a place of worship again. Until 1969, when that act, act, the Holy Cross Abbey, which I showed you as a restored Cistercian Abbey, so that was actually completely in ruins until the 1960s, it was legally not allowed for that to be turned back into a working Catholic church. There had to be um, a, a change in legislation and national legislation for that to take place. And that was passed um, for that particular circumstance only um, so that's why we have this restoration um, uh, at that point which is a really interesting kind of example of uh, these kind of competing um, and it kind of it goes back to the Harlem example maybe these competing priorities between uh, you know what is a church you know is it a space of living worship that's always continuing to change and evolve or is it something that um, is of particular heritage value and, and has a broader uh, resonance and relevance to a community beyond that community of worship I should say as well, um, and it's really important to note that um, new Irish communities are, are reusing the 19th and 20th century church architecture in really important ways. So, for instance, St. Aldwin's Church on High Street Catholic Church, mid 19th century Catholic Church, is now, for instance, um, the Polish Church of Dublin, for example. And um, there's also actually a small Church of Ireland Church, which um, is now in use as a mosque on the uh, South Circular Road. So there's some really interesting examples of kind of reuse as well by, by new religious communities, too. Um, so that's really an important part of the story as well. Yeah, thank you for this answer, Niamh. Um, Sophie. Yes, thank you so much for this insightful talk. I really really enjoyed uh, this tour of um, ecclesial spaces of the past and present. It was really interesting to see. Uh, I have a very specific question um, that concerns the National Inventory of Architectural Heritage. Um, I was wondering about the ratings in this database. Do you happen to know um, on which characteristics these um, ratings are based or is there a committee that decides? I just want you to know more about this. Yeah, that's a really, really interesting question. And for something that has such significance then in terms of how the building is, is managed, um, to a certain extent, it, it comes from the Granada Convention, which the um, which meant that kind of post-1700 architecture had to be listed. And um, so it was, it was really a European convention that meant that, that this was, was listed at all um, and that these records were created. Um, but to a certain extent, it, it's, it's led by the team um, of experts that are employed and it's their um, judgment. I would, you know, it's, it's a wonderful project. It's really, really important. I use it all the time and it's informed by the work of really scholarly um, architectural uh, historians. I would say that it tends to focus very much on formal qualities and that's, you know, that's what it does. That's what it's set up to do. So it is about, you know, um, the, the uh, the, the architect, for example, is it considered in that architectural historian's um, opinion a, an interesting formal example of architecture at that time so it's kind of based on its formal architectural qualities um you know if there is a, a church that would have a you know some particular historical association for instance um then it might be uh, it might be kind of pushed up into being of national significance but to a certain extent it is very much based on those kind of traditional architectural historical markers of kind of what we see of as as high quality design so so yeah that's what i would um that would be my answer thank you it's just that i was wondering that many of the churches that were rated lower probably fall off the restoration edge and so therefore get less attention which is just interesting yeah. to have this kind of value judgment uh, yeah, happening. exactly. And, you know, some of the buildings, like, for example, the, the Magdalene Laundry on Sean McDermott Street, you know, if you're looking at it and saying, well, is this 
a, a, a building of architectural significance. And you would look at the built fabric of the building and say, well, no, it isn't. Look, it's it's pretty shoddy brick. Like it's, you know, it, there's nothing particularly interesting formally here. But it's it, um, it's only when you think about it in terms of its position as infrastructure, its position as kind of social heritage that you you start to to rethink that. So it's your your point is exactly correct. You know, the low grade grading to a certain extent of those buildings um, leads to you know there's no protection really around them then, and there's nothing to even create that pause. And it was really only the fact that you had an interested group of. Um, politicians and survivors in Dublin um, that kind of said, wait a minute, that really shouldn't be a budget hotel. That's a really important site. Um, and I would say it was probably the work of the theatre practitioners and things in advance. So, uh, you know, people had focused attention around it. Um, that that kind of created the, the opportunity for that um, pause that, that um, you know, that they were able to appeal the decision in terms of the planning permission. Um, but it was because that kind of, that focused attention had been there and in other cases it's not there and there's no kind of legal instrument then to kind of create some kind of at least holding space to kind of think about what needs to happen or, you know, or what could happen or even what, you know, even something like, you know, a weekend where people could come together, walk through the site, you know, there, there's there's process. That's that's a really important way of thinking about gathering memory. It doesn't. I think that's where the Atlas of Lost Rooms is really important. There is not going to be one solution for all of these buildings that will fit all of them because they're so they're so multiple, um, uh, and they have such a huge imprint on on the built landscape. So I think we have to think about just at least not rushing into setting them on fire and knocking them down in the middle of the night. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Last question, Matthias. Yeah, uh, Ina mentioned Derek Scully's book uh, about the best Catholics in the world. Um, reading uh, Derek's book, you get the uh, the impression that uh, the topic of, of abuse is, is omnipresent in Ireland. Uh, of course it is, and of course, uh, the more you, you look under the surface, you, the more you would find. Um, And uh, I know that Derek comes from uh, a parish in the north of Dublin, where you showed us the, the demolished uh, giant, huge church uh, with three and a half thousand seats. Um, I know that um, when I was in Ireland for the first time in, in the 80s, um, the Redemptorist Order had a huge uh, community in the south of, of Dublin, which is gone now. And I know that uh, all these communities have, um, have sized down considerably But also under the aspect of, of uh, the abuse scandal, do you think the, the acceptance of the general public for um, conversions of formerly of, uh, religious spaces like churches or convents uh, is, is, um, has become um, bigger now? Or, or is, do you think that the general public is more ready to accept that a church is uh, being converted into um, um, maybe a shopping mall or, or something or i know the church uh, in the center of dublin um having become a tourist information center mm -hmm. but that was uh, already uh, 30 years ago i think or maybe 20 years ago um but i could imagine that people are still uh, reluctant uh, if you discuss with them that their own par parish church might become something else uh, maybe a residential housing uh, complex or whatever. Do you think the, the, the readiness of the, of the public has, has risen to accept um, uh, conversions of religious buildings? That's it's such an interesting question. And, and it's, it's really interesting that you bring up those, those church buildings in Dublin that are used for alternate uses. They are all um, Anglican and Protestant churches. Mm -hmm. So the one that's the tourist information uh, office, for instance, um, which has actually since closed as, as that. And I think it's There's a plan to turn it into a food market of some sort. Um, there's the the um, a really interesting church on Mary Street, which is a pub, like it's a it's a bar, nightclub, restaurant kind of place, which is another use. And I have to say, I brought my mother for a drink there once, and she said, "Oh, you know, the Israelites have taken over the temple or something." <laughs> some kind of biblical <laughs> response um, kind of came out, which was very interesting to observe. Um, but. Uh, 
Yeah, it's, you know, and, and John McCafferty spoke to this, um, which I thought was really important from a canon law perspective when it comes to Catholic churches, because actually canon law provides for what um, a church can be, and it's supposed to be non, non-sordid non use, essentially, um, and obviously that's quite open to interpretation um, uh, f- for what a church, a church building specifically can become. Um, at the moment where Catholic church buildings are being closed, and there's quite a number of them, even some church buildings in Limerick, for example, the Franciscan Church on Henry Street, which would have been an incredibly popular church. And all of you know the work that Sarah Roddy has done in terms of understanding the importance of inscription and kind of personal and social memorialization, it's a perfect example of that. Um, Joe McMahon talked about the fact that his, his relations in Limerick would have well, when they were extremely poor, have always have donated a small amount, a small amount every week and um, every month to the upkeep and the building of that church. So, you know, they are on a local level, incredibly resonant spaces for, for family memory. And there's the importance of burial as well, which I think is still really important for people. So there's kind of a national conversation and then there's a local conversation. And I think that people are still extremely um uh invested actually more invested i think than they realize they are in the church buildings specifically and when we when it comes to ideas of reuse we do see um appropriate reuse really being important so um there aren't that many examples of catholic church buildings that have closed and become reused which i think is interesting the ones that you see across the landscape that have become houses or that have become um you know into commercial premises or bars and restaurants or you know whatever it is they um uh they're all actually anglican um churches rather than catholic churches the ones that have closed and i'm thinking of um of the franciscans and henry street and there's, there's a whole range of different ones they tend to have stayed closed for the moment which you know kind of comes to your question that maybe there isn't a readiness for for change in relation to the actual church building itself um or you have in the case of Finglas where you have that demolition process there is a smaller church being built you know so that 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 parish will have a church it will just have one that's much smaller and more appropriate to the to the community size and it won't cost a fortune to heat it maintain and everything like that um the issue of, of heating people in churches and keeping people warm actually comes up more <laughs> more frequently as a very practical concern in, in many ways when you're when you're looking at the history of ecclesiastical heritage in ireland um but i think that it's it I, yeah I actually would say probably people aren't ready to consider that process of reuse when it comes down to that local level because it's quite interesting that the only example that I can think of really would be um I, I, in terms of parish church would be um the Franciscans in Limerick and that has really just kind of been held as part of a local museum space but it it hasn't transitioned yet which I think is interesting to consider so thanks for that question i'll keep my i'll keep my my thinking cap on to see if i can 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 come up with some examples of of parish church transition specifically so things like for instance um the convent chapels and things like that, that are transitioning more let's say nano legal place the chapel is actually used as kind of a I know a concert space for instance um so so it's still that kind of appropriate use it's that kind of communal gathering uh, kind of space it's not it's not a shopping mall I think people people would react I think quite strongly if that was to be the case still you know even with all of the discourses that are there yeah thank you we actually have run out of our seminar time but um, I think we can allow one final qu- question um, only if it's okay um, I was just curious about um, possible new uses of churches, for example, in more um, rural areas um, where, for example, the congregations aren't as big um, anymore. And because you touched on how um, the life of of both communities are often interwoven uh, with the church itself, um, like, for example, in Germany, um, there sometimes are stone plates with the names of um, the people who died in the Second World War uh, directly put in those churches um, and so on. And I just wondered um, what possible new uses you would uh, propose for um, churches in more rural areas. 
It's interesting, actually, because I would say that the rural churches are probably, the rural parish churches are in a better position in terms of continued use than the urban, in that in the urban, like if you walk around Cork City, for example, you will meet a church on every corner, you know, but um, so it's, it's very often those, those, it's those urban churches that perhaps have, um, uh, you know, just don't have the congregation scale anymore, especially because they were built to house, uh, you know, urban scale populations. So in terms of rural populations, because, and then it comes back again to uh, the interlinking of state and religious kind of services, and because the, the school system is 99% from, um, you know, the, the patron of the school is the Catholic Church, so you have um, the church very linked and very often they're co-located as well. Um, they're very, very kind of connected in terms of the, um, uh, let's say, Holy Communion, Confirmation, Baptism, for instance. So that kind of loop of connectivity, I think, um, maintains a, a level of, of congregational presence within those church buildings. So to a certain extent where you see kind of parochial church closure, um, it would be within the, um, the urban context. But where you really see um, the kind of uh, de dereliction, it's, it's in convent buildings and monastery buildings in particular. Um, so, you know, almost every every, you know, uh, town at least would have had a convent and um, some of those continue to be used as school functions and then in other cases there's just a huge amount of dereliction um, and, and that dereliction kind of persists. As I said, in, actually in, in the town where I grew up, um, you still have the Presentation Convent, a huge building. I think there's about four nuns there at the moment occupying it, but on their grounds they've dedicated um, a large uh, space of the grounds to sheltered housing so you have sheltered housing for older people kind of being built into that environment so that's a really interesting example of I suppose going halfway towards that full transition and I think again it's just um, what will happen then to that much larger building whether that will kind of then become part of that um, uh, I suppose provision of social housing for that community which I think you know very often religious orders see as a very appropriate way to uh or a very pro appropriate thing to have part of the completion of their order um you know for orders you know of religious orders to come to completion is is very emotional i think for for those people you know many of whom lived lives of great service um you know to their communities and i think again you know coming back to that initial point about that critical intimacy it's very hard for us to see those things together when you have such important and resonant um, conversations about abuse, about the fact that, you know, the religious orders have not paid and the redress that is that, that they are required to pay at this point, you know, so you have these kind of interwoven discourses of property value, of redress payment, of orders coming to completion, of community resonance, and you kind of have to see all of those um, together uh, in order to try and understand kind of contemporary uh, responses and understandings and engagements with these. So someone could at the same time say, well, you know, I completely agree that church and state should be separated. They should be completely, uh, you know, the redress should be paid. And at the same time could have a very deep um, personal and emotional connection maybe to a particular building because it's maybe where their father was buried, for instance, you know, so these kinds of connectivities um, are complex um, and I think that there's no easy way kind of to, to separate them. Hey, no more questions. Thank you very much for all your answers and thank you very much for this wonderful talk and the profound and very detailed and differentiated answers. Um, not coming from historical architecture and I think I can speak for everyone here. Um, I think we really learned a lot and got a good insight into your field of research. Thank you. Well, you're so welcome. And I've just noticed that one of your colleagues asked for a list of resources, and I can certainly send that on and um, some of the different websites and, and articles and things like that, because, you know, my approach is, as I think I, I hopefully demonstrated, it's, it's very much about kind of drawing together the work of this group of scholars um, and it's, it's collaborative and we're kind of thinking through all of these collaboratively in an open hearted way, which I think is important. Um, so thank you so much for the opportunity. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you. It's been okay. our pleasure. <laughs> the, the Icewood crew can stay here for yeah. a minute. Yeah, all the rest. Have a good day. Bye bye. See you all soon.